Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about Python and I will start with a story. During my first year of university, we were studying C++. All from the basics. Conditions, loops, pointers, all the way until object-oriented programming. On the third semester, we started studying Java. Again, the whole semester, all the basics, lectures, practice, stuff like that. Then, on the fourth semester, we had a project to write. And our professor told us, you know what? You can write this project in Python. Install this and that, Google, and you will figure it out. So my question is, why do you have to spend a whole year learning C++, half a year learning Java, and absolutely no time learning Python? That's because Python is easy, right? Everybody tells us that Python is the easiest language to use. You don't have to write 100 lines of code like you do in other languages. Write five lines of code and it works. Awesome. So while Python has a great low entry barrier for beginners, there is a side effect. It's way too easy to write code that works. And while it's easy to write code that works, it's very difficult to write code that anyone can actually read. So um, it gets even more dangerous when people who go come to the world of Python already know a few other programming languages. They think, if I can write code in a language that is more complex than Python, then writing in Python should be a breeze. And what happens, they don't take the time to research what's the proper way of doing something in Python, but they use their habits from other languages. The most common example of such thing is a simple for loop. Like in this example, people are used to iterating over lists using indexes, when in Python it's very easy to iterate using items of the list. Now, it's obvious that the code on the right side is much more readable than the code on the left side, but still, it's not a huge deal. We can still understand what's going on. Unfortunately, it becomes a problem in case of larger projects. So what happened in case of our project on the fourth semester? By the end of the course, students started asking others for help. And while I was trying to help them, because I knew Python more or less OK by that time, I couldn't do anything because it was impossible to read their code. So, in general, here's what happens. You come into the world of Python, thinking Python is easy. You write a lot of code fast, then you blame Python for being unreadable, and now you can go and tell your friends that, yeah, I tried Python, it's this spaghetti language for kids, real programmers program in insert your programming language of choice, right? So, what if we actually want to enjoy Python and avoid this trap? I think we should do two things. First of all, we should learn how to do things in a Pythonic way. And then we should learn what absolutely not to do. So here's the first tip. Google even the simplest things using this phrase. Now, even though I've been programming in Python for a few years, I still Google very simple things like, how do you replace an element in a list, or how do you delete a key from a dictionary? Because there's a number of ways of doing that, and depending on your problem, there is the absolute best way. So this makes the smallest uh, segments of your code cleaner, and in the long run, it adds up. The second tip is read the little book of Python anti-patterns. Now, this is a website where they have a compilation of Python programming mistakes. And it's absolutely amazing, I think that every Python programmer should read this. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to do this. And honestly, it's a much better use of your time than this lunch talk. So this brings us to point number three. Stay for the rest of this talk. It wouldn't make sense for me to tell things that are already included in the little book of Python anti-patterns. So I prepared a couple of things I had to learn a hard way 
and I had to learn them a hard way because the answer to those questions isn't the first answer on the first Stack Overflow post you find it on Google. You really have to read some documentation. So we'll talk about exceptions and warnings. Now, why exceptions and warnings? Because they are boring. When you are writing code, you want to write features. You don't really care about exceptions. Your code should run without any errors. Why care about exceptions, right? Now, if you don't care about exceptions, you probably don't even think about warnings. So because you think about those things so little, it's very easy to mess them up. Let's start with exceptions. A quick primer. Raise your hand if you know why this is a bad idea. OK, some people know. Now, if you don't know why this is a big idea, a bad idea, and you program in Python, you should really read the little book of Python anti-patterns. It's probably on the first page there. But generally, the idea is if you are executing a function and you are catching an error that you are expecting, there is probably one type of error that you are expecting. Now, if a bug creeps into your function and raises some other error, and somewhere upper in your code you accept every error, your code will suddenly stop working and you will have no idea why, because your console will be clear. So you should always specify the type of exception you are accepting. And just in case anybody has any doubts, this is just as bad. Now, even though most Python programmers know about it, it's still very common to find code like this. For some reason, people know that uh, you should specify the type of exception you are catching, but they don't bother to specify the type of exception you are throwing. And they don't realize that if you write code like this, then the only way of catching that exception is writing code like this. So probably you get the point. You should always create custom exceptions and throw them instead. But there's more. Raise your hand if you're familiar with try finally statement in Python. Great. Now, for those of you who are not, this is how it works. You write some code in the try block and some, block, uh, some code in the finally block. The code in the try block is executed. If everything goes fine, then the code in the finally block is executed. But if something raises an exception during the try block, the finally block gets executed, and only after it finishes executing, the exception is raised. So this is very useful if you want to clean up some resources, no matter what happens in your code. So here's an example. Let's say we have a fridge class. You can open a fridge, close a fridge, and get fruits from the fridge. And you have some external function, collect fruits. It takes fridge as an input, opens the fridge, then it tries to get some fruits from that fridge. No matter what happens during this fruit collection process, it goes to the finally block to close the fridge, because it doesn't matter if you collect the fruits successfully, or if there are no fruits in your fridge, you always want to make sure you close it afterwards. So you write code like this. And if we look, look at this example, Here's what we expect to happen. We open our fridge, then we execute the getFruits method, and inside this method we have an exception that is being raised. So we accept, expect Python to go to the finally block, close the fridge, and then raise the exception, right? But here's what you get instead. You get nothing. Now, why does this happen? It happens because a function can either return a value or raise an exception. It cannot do both. So if you look closely at this code, you notice that we have a return statement in our finally block. So finally block is executed before exceptions are raised, and you have a return statement in that block. So the function returns before we have a chance to raise the exception. And in the end, we end up with empty output in the console. So to fix this problem, all we should do is move the return statement to the function level. I don't know if you could see that, but there's this subtle difference. And now we get our exception. Now what fascinates me is that accept exception problem I talked about earlier is written on every Stack Overflow post. 
everywhere. If you write accept exception, no matter what you are asking, you will get many angry people writing, don't do that in Python. But this thing results in pretty much the same situation, but nobody talks about it. Your ID doesn't show you any warnings, so it's really useful to know. Now, let's remember to never return anything from the finally block and move on to warnings. Now, imagine you're writing an application. You have a fruits module and additives module. In your fruits module, you wrote some code for oranges. And say you want to add some arsenic to your oranges. You import arsenic from the additives module and add it to your orange. Now, in the code for your arsenic object, everything it does is it raises a warning. You test this code, the warning appears in the console, and everything works as, as expected. But then your management comes, and they tell you, you know what, could you please remove that warning, because we don't want our customers to know that our oranges are poisonous. So what does the developer do? He goes to Google. Then he finds the first post on Stack Overflow. There's some nice code, only two lines, extremely elegant. He copies it and pastes it into the fruits module. Warnings dot filter warnings ignore. Now he runs his code and everything works great, right? The management is happy. But then, a few weeks later, another developer is writing vegetables pa package. And he is updating some code for tomatoes. He noticed that there is an old tomato in the code, so he wrote a new tomato. And now what does he have to do? He has to add a deprecation warning to old tomato class, right? so that the users know that they should switch to using new tomatoes instead of old tomatoes. He tests his, tests his code and notices that deprecation warning doesn't appear in the console. So what does he do? He goes to Google and finds the first post on Stack Overflow. He copies some code. Actually, it's the same piece of code the other developer copied. But instead of ignore, he wrote always. He tests his code, and everything works great. The warning is visible in the console. Now, everything starts to go wrong when this application goes to users. The first user is using both oranges and tomatoes and uh, doesn't suspect anything because everything is great. The deprecation warnings don't appear, and the arsenic warnings don't appear as well. But the other user is terrified because he just found out there's arsenic in his oranges, and he is going to die. Now, why does this happen? Why does one user receive only receive no warnings and the other user receives all warnings? Do you see a subtle difference between this slide and the previous slide? On the first two lines, the sequence of imports decides what warning, second, uh, what warnings settings were used. That's because, in this case, fruits are imported after vegetables, and in fruits, we just disabled all warnings. So the settings from vegetables get ignored. On the contrary, here in the vegetables module, we enabled all warnings. So this happens because filter warnings manages warnings globally. And it's possible to affect warnings outside the current module. Same for simple filter function, with, which is also in that module. Now, how do we avoid it? If possible, we shouldn't do anything with the warnings on library level. We should leave this to the user. The user should decide himself which warnings he wants to see. But obviously, in this case, we wanted to decide for the user. So what should we do? The answer is we should read some documentation and find out that there are additional arguments to this filter warnings function, which let us specify the category of our warning and the module which we want to affect. So in this case, we just add some code saying that we want to ignore arsenic warnings from the additives module. And we do the same thing in vegetables, run the code, and everything works as expected. Now, quick tip, the same logic applies to login module, which is very commonly used. You should probably never use methods like basic config and set level somewhere deep in your code in your libraries. You should always leave it for the user. Now, 
This is probably everything I could tell in a 15 minute talk. If you want to read some more examples, you can visit my GitHub. Thank you for your attention and have a great time at CodeDive. <laughs>